to start by saying you don't know how much I appreciate your this morning wishing me a happy birthday. I was here for that. I know I was standing at the back, and uh, I appreciate it more than you, you know. I always want to be <clears throat> grateful. I never want to take anything for advantage. The way that this church has loved on me and my family, we appreciate it more than you'll ever know. Uh, those small things, they matter a whole lot. Uh, this morning I received a, a card from Grace with a very generous gift in it, and so I appreciate it uh, like you'll never know. We're so happy to be here and be a part of the family here at Grace. And uh, we appreciate it a great deal to be here and be part of your family. As you can tell, there's a little bit of uh, gruffiness to my voice. <clears throat> so I, I don't know what it is. I was at a sporting event yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> or it could be my wife because uh, <clears throat> she sounded like this all week. So I, it's one of the two. Uh, not sure which. So uh, I digress a little bit talking about sports. Y'all started it this morning. I didn't. <laughs> I was with my little girl Friday. We were in Walmart. We were Christmas shopping for uh, one of her brothers. And as we walked through the door, this gentleman came by us. And uh, she's not here, so I can pick on her. <clears throat> this gentleman came by and he had a Gamecock shirt on. And she's got this little, she crinkles her nose. If you've ever seen her, it's almost painful to look at. <laughs> and I said, what's wrong with you? She said, ew, he's got a game. Sure. <laughs> she has been converted uh, to Clemson. <laughs> yeah, I've got no voice. I've got to get you somewhere this morning. I'm just excited about something. Happy Bibles this morning. Why don't you turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9. And I want us to look at verses 6 and 7. Thank you all. They tell me if I turn my mic on, it will help me. I want us to look at chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 of Isaiah, and our theme for this month, as you read there in your, your bulletin, your handout, is we want to refocus. You know, much of the time, I've noticed... This year, as I looked at commercials, a lot of them are talking only about, if you will, holidays and holidays and holidays. And we've heard that over and over. And as Christians, we've ranted about that. Where is Christ in the holidays? You know, I want you to understand something. It really does us no good to rant and rave to the world about taking Christ out of Christmas. They're lost. They've never met him. The problem we have is we've taken him, the believers, we've taken him out of our lives. Or we at least put him over here on a shelf to when it's convenient. And so what I want to challenge you to do is, challenge all of us to do this month, is we want to refocus. Let's make sure that we focus in all of our business, in all of the great things that we, you know, I'm not telling you not to celebrate and have a good time this month. As Christmas rolls in. But I just want us to refocus. So that for the next. For all of this month. Even the cantata. All of it is intentional. About us refocusing. About why we gather here every Sunday. And as we look at this passage here. This is. I call it the first Christmas. And I want you to look with me for a minute. In your mind's eye. As we allow the spirit of God. To show us this first Christmas. Christmas. Now, this passage was written 700 years before Jesus' birth. There in Bethlehem. And I want you to think with me for a second. I want you to look out over all of history. This past week, Nelson Mandela died. Many of you know that. You've heard that. But as we look over human history, there are several events that people point to and they say this is, without a shadow of a doubt, the most important event in human history. And, and different people name different things. Some would name when we landed on the moon. Others would name when a terrible disease has been cured. A deadly disease has been brought to nothing. But what I want to declare to you this morning is the event that we're about to read about this morning is the pivotal 
most important event of all mankind. The event we're about to read about is this. Everything pales in comparison. When Almighty God came down from heaven to earth and he walked among us, we call that the incarnation. And it all began at a time we call Christmas. If you have your copy of God's Word this morning and you're able to, would you stand with me in honor of the reading of the Word of God this morning? <laughs> Isaiah 9, let's read verses 6 and 7. And the word of God says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Amen. Amen. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father God, as we come this morning, your people gathered under your name. God, we're so grateful that as we've gathered here this morning, that Lord, we can call upon your name. We've experienced the saving power of the Son of God. The, the transformational power that you sent here almost 2,000 years ago, Lord, at some point in our lives, we have experienced that same power within us. God, thank you for the greatest gift ever given. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you be seated? <clears throat> As we look together this morning, I, I want us to look at Peter 2,000 years ago. And, and I want us to look at that baby there in the manger. <coughs> and so the first thing that I want you to see this morning about this most incredible event is knowing the baby of Bethlehem. And I want you to think about that for a second. There in verse 6, there's two phrases, and they're very important. One is, a child is born. The other is, a son is given. This is the very first Christmas gift ever given. It's why we celebrate Christmas, period. There, there really is no other reason to celebrate Christmas. It's really not a holiday to even speak of without this event. And as you look at those two phrases, I want you to really hold in on them. Look there in your Bible, <laughs> in verse 6, it says, right there, For to us a child is born and a son is given. Those two phrases mean two very important things as you look at that baby in the manger. Now, here's the controversy of why, if you will, the world wants to, to move away from the nativity scenes. Here's the real issue. As you look there, the first thing speaks of his humanity. The second phrase there speaks of his divinity. The first phrase of his humanity, a child is born. The second phrase, a son is given, is talking about the divinity of God. And what it means is God is wrapped in flesh. A son is given. You know what that means? It literally means that heaven's son is given. And so the first Christmas and the first gift is very important this morning. Jesus' beginning was not in Bethlehem. Now think that through for a second. I want us to look at his majesty. Because the second phrase is declaring his deity. And so to do that, keep your finger here. Flip over to John chapter 1, the Gospel of John. And I want us to look at the first three verses. Let's just start with the first verse in John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 1. Look what it says with me. It says, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos. The Logos, depending on. <laughs> and the Word was with God, and the Word, the Logos, was God. Do you notice in your Bible that the Word is capitalized? That is so important. And so a question comes to mind, and I'm going to ask you this morning, I want you to think about this, all right? What is that saying? 
Is it saying that he was with God? Or is it saying that he was God? The answer is yes. Now think about that for a second. Before the beginning, before history, he was God. Let's read the first three verses of that same chapter. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Well, what does that mean exactly? How many of you, if you look at your tag this morning, and it's stamped China or India? <laughs> Almost nobody says you have, right? <laughs> That's what it's saying. But look around this morning. Can, can you look beyond the clouds? Can you remember when the sun shines through that? Everything you see, this passage of scripture is saying, it's stamped Jesus. Made by, verse 3, the words. The word. But what does John mean when he says that Everything that was made was made by the Word. Here's what he's saying. Jesus is the Word. What is the Word? Now, we talked a little bit. I gave you a hint of this on Wednesday night if you were in the Bible study. What is a Word? What is words? What do words do? Words are expressions of And so Jesus is the Word. Do you know what that means? It means that He is an expression of God. Jesus articulates God like our words articulate our thoughts. Jesus Christ is God. He is fully God. So when John says in the beginning, he's not talking about the beginning of Jesus. He's talking about the state of Jesus. You see, there it refers to Genesis 1 in the, the beginning of humanity. But he's not talking about the beginning of Jesus. Jesus was before that. Jesus didn't begin with a manger. He wasn't, uh, his beginning was not when he was born of Mary. He existed before all of that. Now look back over, if you will, in Isaiah 9, 6. There in Isaiah... It says a child is born, a son is given. You see, here we have the mystery of the universe. That God could translate deity into humanity. And when he did that, he did it without distorting humanity or discarding deity. Laying there in the manger is the God who created the universe. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Friend, what I've just declared to you is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you speak that gospel, you need to understand there are those out there who will think you are insane. And they have no problem with the holidays because they never receive the gift of God and they don't know what Christmas is about. That's what the holidays are about. It's our opportunity to give the greatest gift ever. We shouldn't be offended or hurt or mad. We should take the opportunity to share the love of God from our heart. Second thing I want you to see is the wonderful counselor of Bethlehem. Now I want you to think through some things with me. As we think about this issue of counseling, the major need of our day is counseling, isn't it? As you watch the news, we see, uh, because of the wars we've been in, we see soldiers coming back, and the reality is they have a great deal of things going on with the effects, the negative effects of war. As you look around, there's economic hardships, the, the rate of the family that's being, uh, uh, the turmoil that's going on within the family, child abuse, and all the other things that we see, there absolutely is a definite need for 
counselors today. Science has given us psychology and psychiatry. And I want you to understand something. I thank God for them. There are many godly pastors that have stepped up to the, to the plate and have taken on counseling. My wife and I are certified family and marriage counselors. And so there's an important need for that today. But here's the thing that you need to understand and I need to understand. We, all of us counselors, we're only but flesh. The Bible here speaks of Jesus as the wonderful counselor. You ought to underscore the word wonderful. It literally means miraculous. We need a miracle working counselor today in all of what's going on. And as a counselor, the, the issue is this. I can only tell you what not to do again. I have no power to cure the sin in your heart that continues to make you do it and offend over and over. But do you know who does? The great physician, the one who's never lost a patient. The Bible says in John 7, 47, the soldiers exclaim, no man ever spoke like this man. The Bible describes him as the most successful counselor ever. The Bible says that the harlot came in all that she had at his feet. And the Bible says that the tax collector climbed the tree just to, clap, to, to get a glimpse of him. Heads of state, the Bible tells us, have sought advice from him. People day and night followed after him. The blind, the demon possessed, the lame, the guilt ridden, the lonely, everywhere, day and night. Do you know why? Because there it says he is the counselor. Counselor means the one who gives advice. Colossians 2.2 2 says, All wisdom and knowledge is hidden in Christ. He is the wonderful counselor. But you know, the world will look at us and say, I don't understand this Jesus thing. Well, I want to pose a question to you. <coughs> Let's look back to 6,000 years. And as you look back 6,000 years and we look at a human and humanity and our attempt to cure our woes, let's be honest. There are civilizations as great as ours, Rome, that has come and gone. But my question that I pose to you is, after over 6,000 years of man's wisdom, oh, where really has it gotten us? Let's just be honest. We never achieved the utopia that we've been promised generation after generation after generation after generation. You go back and you study history. I'm a history buff. Every error in history, someone promises through our own ingenuity and intellect to cure our problems. Can anybody stand up and declare to me one generation that's cured? Nobody can. Other. Than the Lord. None have solved man's problems. Again, Colossians 2 2. All wisdom and knowledge is hidden in him. What is his advice for the downtrodden? His advice for those that are lost? Your faith has made you well go and sin no more. You know, I thank God for psychiatrists and doctors and pastors, but the reality is the only one that can cure the sin sick soul is the wonderful counselor. Nicodemus came to him with his man-made religion, with his dead philosophy. Jesus healed The woman at the well, she came hopelessly bound by her passion. She was hopelessly enslaved to the results of her sinless lifestyle. Jesus healed her sin-sick heart so much so that she brought everybody in her village between Jesus. The man who knew all the Bible says the man that knew her heart, that knew all she ever did, yet still loved her. See, his name is significant. It speaks of his saving nature. What's so wonderful about the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? In Matthew's account, when Mary was told by the angel that you'll have a baby, the Bible says his name is Jesus and he shall save his people. The third thing is the baby in Bethlehem. Also the mighty God. You know, as we all chase the sails that are going on, 
as we look around and we deck the halls and we get stressed over what's done, what's not done, do we really stop to think about this baby that's born in Bethlehem? To think that God looked all over heaven. To look for someone who could bridge the gap between God's justice and his righteousness and man's sin sickness. Have you looked at the nativity scenes and looked into the baby's face and thought about the fact that God looked all over heaven? Who could bridge this gap? Would it be Gabriel, his angel, that has been sent on many missions and has been successful every time? Yet the Bible says in Peter that the angels look into this thing of salvation with mystery and awe. They can't understand it. They can't grasp it. They've never experienced salvation. No, there's but one that could be the one to bridge this gap. Now, I told you I love history. During the Civil War, while they were having Lincoln's funeral, as the procession went by, there was an African-American woman holding her son up, and she said, look, there's the man who died to save you. Let me ask you a question. When we think about Christmas, have you ever really understood that that baby in the manger is the God who died to save us? The Bible says in Hebrews 7.25 that no one else could do it. Not only could no one else do it, but he did it for all. It doesn't matter this morning where you are in your journey. It doesn't matter if you're the religious sinner, the pagan sinner, the intellectual sinner, the ignorant sinner, the cultural sinner, or the depraved and the wicked. It doesn't matter. Hebrews 7.25 says he died for us all. Amen. And it says there in verse 6, And the government shall set up on his shoulders. Do you realize as you look at that baby this Christmas, that that baby is also a king. That he was born to rule. What does that mean? Let me explain it to you. When it says that the government shall be upon his shoulders, when you look at that baby, that's why those three wise men brought all of those gifts to the king there. Because our faith in all of it, the beginning and completion of it, is there in the fact of his being king. The first time he came as savior, the second time he came, and he will, as he comes, he will be the almighty king. That has implications. Listen to me this morning. It has some serious implications. That means that even now there is required lordship in salvation. So what do you mean, Pastor? I mean that if we name his name, then we must follow him. We must serve him. Or can there really be a relationship? All of that. From that baby in the manger. Not then, not now, nor ever can we separate the cradle, the cross, or the crown. I was talking to some of you this morning <clears throat> about Jehovah's Witnesses. And, and I'm going to be honest with you. As I drive here for church every morning, as I drive here every morning, I pass that big Mormon temple up here on Wells Highway. And I'm going to be honest with you. Listen to me. What you don't hear is a mad, angry rant. But as I pass that temple every day, it disturbs my soul. And can I tell you why it disturbs my soul? Because there are people in Oconee County that are gathering this morning and worshiping a false god, and they will spend eternity in hell. And that bothers my soul. As we talked about the Jehovah's Witnesses, do you know that they gather and they have their own religious system and they have built a bridge to hell? Because, friend, they don't know Jesus. They don't believe that the baby in the manger is the Jehovah they call. And you need to understand something. What this means is there is salvation in no other name. Do you, do you think that way? When you drive past, remember we've talked about it. 
There's 5,000 people out of 80,000 people in this county on, in what we call a Christian church on a Sunday morning. All those other people are worshiping. But they don't know the one who God chose to bridge the gap between his righteousness and our sins. And that's what the gift is about. That's what Christmas is all about. Fourthly, as you look at the baby of Bethlehem here, the everlasting father, it says there in verse 6, there's a comparison and a parallel. There's a comparison and a contrast here. Think about it, the everlasting father, then the baby and the donkey's father. What's being said here in Hebrew thought, whenever the word father is mentioned, it always means the inventor. Or, if you will, the founder. That's why in Genesis uh, 4, 21, Jerubal is the founder of the heart. Socrates is the founder of philosophy. Herodotus is the founder of history. Jesus is the founder of Christianity. Jesus is the founder of life. The Father. Everlasting Father, the Father of life. The Alpha and the Omega. There is no end. Hebrews 1, 1 says it this way. In times past, God spoke in various ways. But now, through his son. You see, Jesus is the father of light in a dark, dark world. Isaiah is explaining there to us that God has revealed himself to us through Jesus. I don't know about you, but that's pretty incredible. And so much so that, have you ever noticed that when Jesus spoke to the Father, he never, ever, ever called him by his name. Never would he call him Jehovah or El Shaddai, but he always called him what? Father. Even when he told the parable of the, the prodigal son, he never said the son came back to the king. The son came back to him. Remember Philip's question to Jesus in John 14, 9. Lord, show us God. Show us the Father. And it will be enough. What did he say? Have I been with you so long? And yet you have not known me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Well, what's that mean, preacher? There is but one access to the Father. And it's Jesus. Listen to me. All roads lead to hell. One road leads to heaven. That's what that passage means. 2,700 years ago, before your philosophy teacher got up and taught you that many roads lead to heaven, Jesus already said, there's one way, there's the map. 2,700 years ago. That means that all those wiser men than Christ that bypassed the baby in Bethlehem, they're not on the right road. They missed the Savior of the world. The fifth thing, look what it says, the Prince of Peace found in the manger. The greatest message ever proclaimed, the angels proclaimed 2,000 years ago, peace on earth and what? Goodwill toward men. A little baby came to, to remove the conflict between God and an unholy man. I want you to think about that. Do you realize this morning that every person has a conflict with God? And the only person, why do you think we stand up here every Sunday and say, if you never ask Jesus into your heart, listen, the turmoil that, you, that you're experiencing, the drugs and the alcohol and the materialism, whatever it is you're trying to quiet that turmoil with, there's only one who can. All of us are born with that turmoil. The difference between me and you is Jesus, that little baby, that peaceful little baby in the manger, that's who took my turmoil. That's the gift. That's what it means when he says peace on him. That's the prince of peace. There's a young man who looked at his, his father there, a picture of his daddy, who was off at war. And he'd been gone for a long time. And the longer that he looked at that picture there on the nightstand, the more distant his father felt. And he said this. He said, if only daddy could step out of that picture and be real. The 
truth of Christmas, the truth of sin and hopelessness, is that God did step out of that picture. And it became real. There in Jesus. You see, when man had forgotten God, do you know what God did? He stepped out of that picture. And he stepped into the world because he never forgot us. Friend, when you look around the world, it's easy to say, and you hear people say that all the time, what a mess this world is. If there's a real God, where is he? How many times have you heard atheists say, listen, because I've had whatever this traumatic experience is, or because I've witnessed this injustice, there can be no God. There's no way there's a God and, and this has gone on. So, so what's really happening there, preacher? Where is God? What's going on? Well, I want to answer that question. So get out your pencils. Let me answer that question. How many times have you looked at Jerusalem and the wars that's going on in Jerusalem and, and said, where is their peace that God promised? Listen, when he came 2,000 years ago, they rejected him. And because they rejected him, they won't see peace until he comes back again. When you look around the world today and you see all of the hell and the torment and all that's going on, the reason is not because God's here. The reason is not because God's not powerful. The reason is the world has rejected the only peace there is. You know, it's always interesting to me that when they're interviewing these atheists, they never come talk to me or interview me. <laughs> or you. Because when you're going through the valley of the shadow of death, when you're experiencing the storm and the waves are big and it's dark, who's all? He's always there. That's why Colossians 3.15 says that the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. As we look at the TV, war here and there, and God help us. Have you turned on the news? And have you, has there been a day, I'm just asking, that there's not been a murder or some horrible event or hear of a family's tragedy or being torn up let me be honest with you this morning. As we look across our land, hey, as we look across this auditorium this morning, there's not a whole lot of souls that are experiencing the peace of the prince this morning if we just be real honest with ourselves. Can I ask you a question this morning? Before another Christmas comes and goes, before this year's end, why not accept the greatest gift? The whole reason we celebrate Christmas. Why not? Why would you go through another year without peace? Pastor, you say, what is Christmas really all about? It's really about God coming to earth to live and to walk and to laugh and to cry and to take your sin and my sin. And do away with it. Maybe you say this morning, Pastor, can I really experience peace? Can I really have that gift? Can God really save me? You know, I read a story this week of another man who's asking that same question. Right in the midst of religious people all around him. Mr. Bulletin. Listen to his story and see if any of you can relate this morning because you are in church. Let me tell you something. There are churches all over America this morning where there are people that don't know Jesus and don't have God's peace in their heart. And there's some of you that are looking at me this morning. You've tried this and you tried that and you tried religion. You tried this Sunday school class. You tried that preacher. And you can't find what I'm talking about. That's right. Listen to his story. One Sunday morning, he made up his mind to be a Christian. Never doubted that he, would, he knew what to do. He would leave off this evil thing or already get rid of that evil thing or, or that thought and he would replace it with new good ones in his life. He would read his Bible more and he would pray more the next year. He would repent and weep if possible 
that evidently he thought was the proper way. And so he began. On Sunday he proposed well. On Monday and Tuesday he almost succeeded. But on Wednesday and Thursday he made some serious slips. And by Friday he'd given up in despair. But started in earnest again, well, on Sunday. And in his self-confidence, he thought he knew where he had gone wrong. And he would try to guard against the danger. So he read his Bible more diligently. Prayed with increasing devotion. At times falling asleep, kneeling beside his bed. He watched more carefully and imagined that he repented more deeply. Often he wept and hid his tears. And then came the wonderful Sunday afternoon when the new minister was to give his first address to the Sunday school. Fullerton remembered just one sentence of all that he said, but it was just what he needed to hear. All you have to do to be saved is take God's free gift. And say thank you. an incredible light. Before he had been trying to get God to take his gift. Are you tired of trying to get God to take your gift? Of trying to do right, be right, speak right. I don't this Christmas. I want to ask you this morning, with absolute certainty, without any shadow of a doubt, nobody's looking around. If you can say 110% preacher, I have the peace of God in my heart this morning, and I know without a shadow of a doubt that I am His. He is mine. If you know that, nobody looking around, raise your hand. Raise your hand this morning. Keep them up. Raise them up. There's some of you who them down. And honestly, this morning, you can't raise your hand. Listen, there's absolutely nothing difficult, hard, about receiving the gift of God. Because God's already done all the work. This morning, if you're here, and you don't have the peace of God in your heart. I want you to look at me this morning. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. If you need everybody else to be in prayer. Remember last Sunday? You're praying for heaven to come down. And God to change hearts. If you're here this morning. And you need the peace of God in your heart. You need to be saved. Just look at me. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. Just look at me. Those of you that are looking at me right now from where you are, I want you to pray from your heart to his. Simply just say, Lord, just pray right now from your heart to his. Lord God, come into my heart. God, transform me. Lord, save me. God, thank you for the gift. If you prayed that prayer this morning, I'm going to ask you to do something else when we stand the same. I'm going to be down here. I'm going to ask for others in the church to be down here with me. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, you come down because we want to encourage you. You've just been given the greatest gift ever. You come and let us pray with you. Maybe this morning you want to come, get on the altar and pray. Maybe you want to come and join our church. You come, we'll receive you in whatever way we'll receive members. Whatever God's put on your heart, you come this morning. Let's stand and sing our invitations.